from the Montana State Library and it's good to have you here this morning for our webinar on mobile hotspots and you're probably wondering why did they wait so long to do this webinar but sometimes we're a little bit slow but we do catch on to the fact that this is a good topic and all the attendees here thus far show that it's a good topic and one that you're interested in and so um, we've got a few other people on the panel today we've got um, guests from South Carolina. We have Shelby Kelly and Jennifer Jean. You'll be hearing from them in a minute. And then we also have Megan Glidden from um, Imagine If Library in Kalispell. And I'm going to start off just briefly because I thought um, it would be a good thing for us to um, maybe not assume that everybody's on the same page when we're coming to just exactly what is a hotspot. And I probably should have put this into presentation view before I got up here because once you get in here, um, it's hard to maneuver around, but you can deal with the slide as it is. And so um, just briefly, a mobile hotspot is this little device. This is an example of one of the T-Mobile ones. It's kind of like a hockey puck kind of device. And it is, um, it does come from cellular providers. And what it does is it enables the user to log on to the internet via a cellular connection. So it, you're getting cellular data through this hotspot and it's a wireless connection. Um, you just log on with um, a password to it and you can access the internet. Now, when you're thinking about it, it's gonna work best where there's a good cellular connection, a good strong cellular connection. So as we're discovering in Montana, um, all places are not equally well served by um, cell phones and cell data. So, you know, if you're close to a tower, it's probably going to do better than if you've got a mountain in the way or, you know, something like that. Um, the, you know, which providers have stronger, um, have more towers and better connections makes a difference too. T-Mobile is new to Montana, so we've learned a lot by doing this project with them is to, um, what it means when they say they have good or great service, um, you know, whether that actually translates to good or great service, but um, we're learning. And Verizon is our other provider. But um, basically, you know, it's, it's pretty easy, uh, but it is dependent on a lot of, you know, what is available from the cellular providers. And so what we're doing, what we're offering is, um, you know, if you've signed up for this with us, is we send you a hotspot and we're paying for the data, unlimited. Um, and we also know unlimited means different things in the cellular world than it does in the real world, but we can talk about that later if we have time afterwards, if you wanna get into that a little bit more, because we're kind of learning what that means in real life too. And so we should know that better, and South Carolina may know more about what that means from their experience and they can share that. Because uh, unlimited does not mean really unlimited. And then I wanted to make sure that you all were familiar with our Hotspot Lending Program webpage. And so I included the link down below. And I think if Joe could put that in chat, that would also be helpful. We've updated it recently. Amelia has done a great job with putting all kinds of resources up here. And we decided we'd make it a little bit easier so you didn't have to scroll through this one long page with tons of good information. And so we did a table of contents um, for it. So now you can break it down a little bit as to what kinds of specific things you're looking for. So if you're just getting started with this, um, we have examples of policies and templates. Um, we have some marketing materials, um, some directions for setting them up and using them, and just some FAQs about the program. So please um, feel free to come and, and use it. And, and if you're not finding what you're looking for, um, ask one of your consultants, ask me. I'm kind of the default hotspot person on here. And 
um, and John Kilgour is the one who you deal with when um, he's actually sending out the devices and working with the providers. So um, we're here to help. And now I'm going to turn over the reins to our colleagues from South Carolina. And I just going to, Joe, I'm going to jump in. The link to that mobile hotspot web page is in the chat box. Good morning, everybody. I'm Shelby Kelly. And my partner, Jennifer Jean, is here with me. Hello. <laughs> Good morning. And we're both statewide program coordinators at the South Carolina State Library. We started our um, Access South Carolina program in 2018 under homework help centers. So um, we gave out many grants, subgrants to public libraries, and they were able to create um, homework help centers within their library. And a lot of them purchased mobile hotspots, or you may hear me call them MiFi's a lot. Um, same thing. And they purchased their devices from Kajit, which is an educational-based mobile hotspot um, company. And from there, it kind of evolved, especially once we got the CARES money and we realized there was a great need for um, hotspots and broadband expansion across the state. So we turned it into our Homework Help Center broadband expansion project. Um, we started with two gigabytes of data because that seemed to work with our Homework Help Center project originally, but that was just for before and after school doing homework. And we quickly realized that that is not nearly enough when kids are in Zoom meetings for school. So we have done, we've moved to Unlimited. We actually just finished the process of transitioning all of our MiFi's to Unlimited which is very different than what you think Unlimited is. Um, it tends to be about 30 gigabytes per month, and then mm -hmm. they take you back down to about 50 megabytes per day once you've hit that 30 gigabytes um, until the next billing cycle, and then you go back to the 30 gigabytes of use. Um, we have them all across the state. I think we have 750 devices mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. across all of South Carolina and they're in rural communities and large cities um, and everybody is using the devices very, very differently. Some places are partnering with their school systems to help their students. Um, others are checking them out purely for adult entertainment so that they can watch Netflix and YouTube and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. We have libraries that are partnering with child care centers and they've used smart bus devices, which are MiFi's, but they can um, be used for more people. Up to 100 people can access it at the same time. And we've been checking those out to child care centers so that when they come after school or anything, they can also work on their schoolwork. Um, we've partnered with universities across the state to help kids mm -hmm. um, or college students. Um, do their homework and everything and also a large population of job seekers have been checking out our devices And that's pretty much all I have Jennifer. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> you pretty much um, covered everything. Yeah And um, this is Joe just checking in or we don't have any um, questions or comments yet in the chat box but I, I'm I, I have a question and that is did you provide libraries with um, policies or uh, process, a specific process for how these can be used or lended? Were you, did you limit that at all or did you leave that up to individual libraries? We left what? that up to individual <laughs> libraries. Um, however, the devices are education, because they're through Kajit, they are education specific. So the filtering on it is very specific. And we do have the opportunity to change that filtering and some mm -hmm. of our libraries have. Um, our main goal with this project is to get them out into the community and give those who need access to internet that access. And in the chat box again, this is Joe. Um, uh, this is a question from our a librarian in Bozeman. How did your library get the word out about the hotspot lending program? How did, how did they promote it to their communities? I know some of the libraries um, use the newspaper um, in their communities, um, sending um, 
flyers out to schools, uh, reaching out through the schools. Um, I also had a library that reached out to uh, the Department of Social Services. So with their WIC program, um, you know, they, they give the information to those families. So then those families go to those libraries and then they can uh, check out the MyFi's. And uh, one social services, she said her response was, that was a really brilliant suggestion. Thanks for sharing that. And then one more yeah. um, comment or question. Curi uh, librarian, curious about the ones that you mentioned that allow multiple users access at once. Could you just say a little more about those? Absolutely. So Kajit calls them smart buses. Um, they're just MiFi devices that allow up to 100 people using it at once, and they're usually installed into buses. A lot of our libraries have installed them into their um, bookmobiles, and mm -hmm. if you park them in different areas for any length of time, people can access the internet while that vehicle is parked in that area. But those are not unlimited. Uh, that's just five uh, gigabytes monthly for the smart bus riders. That's everything in the chat box. Suzanne, back to you. Okay, thank you very much. That was Sorry. very informative. I couldn't type fast enough. Um, this is Danny in Lewistown. Just really quick, you're talking about gigabytes and how quickly they get spent. If the the uh, whatever smart buses only have five gigabytes do those get spent out incredibly quickly or do you end up paying significant overages with those we have not um a lot of the libraries have not gotten the smart buses out just okay. yet um the ones that have uh we have not heard anything that you know we've run out so uh we have not gotten any emails on that yet <laughs> okay so. okay thank you shelby did you have anything there yeah okay <laughs> and i think i'd have to look this up again but um khajiit was not one that we considered i suspect it was because they were using sprint as their um, provider and because there were a lot of low cost um, MiFi providers that use Sprint and Sprint had no coverage in Montana whatsoever. So this was not an option. So um, smart buses, if they're strictly a Khajiit, may not be an option for us, but um, I would assume some of the other carriers may have something like that. I just haven't heard about them if people are interested. But at five gigs, that's, I mean, I love those low numbers it's like that does not seem terribly useful to me in real life you know maybe if you've just got the kids on the buses and it's like you can't look at any videos you, can, you know all you can do is download text files and pdfs and then move on but but it's i love these things it's fascinating to hear what's going on in other communities and what's working and what isn't working and speaking of that we'll now move on to megan from imagine if and she can share what they've been doing with their uh, mobile hotspots. Thanks, Suzanne and Joe, and thanks, Shelby and Jennifer, for talking about what you have going on. Um, and I'm Megan Glidden. I'm a senior librarian at Imagine If Libraries and um, started working on this project doing um, Wi-Fi hotspots and lending devices. And I have just a little um, uh, presentation I put together mostly for our library board, but I will share my screen so you can see that and just kind of talk through a little bit about what we're doing and feel free to ask questions and interrupt along the way. Let me see if I can get this going here. Can you all see that now? Yes. All right. All right. Thanks. Great, so we called our program Tech Connect, and we were so excited uh, when we heard that the State Library was offering these Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, we had been working on getting some independently, so we have a few Wi-Fi hotspots that we had procured for ourselves, and then we have far more that we got from uh, the State Library. 
and just so excited about this. Um, we really knew that, um, you know, the digital divide is a real thing and we see it every day in our library. We especially noticed it when, um, you know, the pandemic hit and people who came into the library every single day to get on the internet couldn't do that anymore. Um, so we know that access to the internet is crucial, like, you know, and not everyone has it. So um, broadband access in Montana is limited and is just not even available in some areas uh, of our county. Um, and we're Flathead County, which is up in the northwest part of Montana uh, near Glacier National Park. Um, and then um, there are also limited places where people can go to access it. You know, if you don't have it at home um, and the library's closed and job services closed, you know, and cafes are closed, it's just a challenge to get that access to the internet. And so many services these days have moved online, um, you know, filing for unemployment, census, taxes, you know, all those crucial services and crucial forms and things to complete are just not available um, in paper format anymore. And I know we get people coming into the library all the time complaining about, you know, tax forms are harder to get and, you know, all those things. And, and it really is a disadvantage if you can't navigate that system easily. And so Tech Connect was kind of our answer to trying to get at some of those issues. Um, you know, we're trying to connect people to the devices they need and give them access in a changing world. Um, and so we have a couple different um, ways that we've done that. We have the Wi-Fi hotspots. And, you know, a lot of <laughs> our staff and customers, you know, we talk about um, trying to explain it to people. And for a long time, we were saying, like, we have a hotspot. Particularly, we have um, people who are not interested in wearing masks, and they come in, and we have some kind of conflict, and they need access to the internet. And we say, well, we have a hotspot. A lot of people, they don't know what that is. And so we really started saying, like, we can give you the internet to take to your home, <laughs> you know, and just trying to rephrase it so people can understand it and say, this is like something you can have wherever you need the internet. And, you know, we do the caveat because it's not everywhere. Like you all mentioned, um, the hotspots don't work everywhere in Montana because it's based on cell service. But in general, it's basically you take it and you get it where you need it. And so that has been really successful in explaining it that way to people. Um, you know, even saying Wi-Fi, sometimes like people don't get that. So just saying this can give you the internet where you need it, it can take it with you, you get it for two weeks, um, is really helpful for people in our, our experience explaining it to people that way. Um, so we have just individual hotspots that people can check out. We also um, did some kind of bundles with devices. So we have um, iPad kits. So we bundled a hotspot with an iPad. Um, because we know while there are a lot of people who have their own devices, maybe it's a phone, maybe it's a laptop, and they just need the Wi-Fi um, um, to access. Uh, some people don't have those devices, or if they are, or maybe they have a phone, but they're trying to work on a job application and like, or writing a paper and trying to do that on your phone and that tiny space is really just not, um, ideal. And so we know that there are people out there that need those. And we especially bundled our Surface Go kits, thinking of people who are in that situation who may be filling out job applications or writing papers or doing that kind of thing, so that it's a tablet with a keyboard and a hotspot all together. So basically, it's this little kit you can take and try to meet those needs for you. And all of these devices check out for two weeks at a time um, and are non-renewable. So it's, it's been working pretty well for us. Um, we've also been able to um, work out different partnerships with people. We have um, one with the Kalispell Regional Hots Hospital um, where they had a project they were working on and they needed to transition to doing Zoom meetings for their group. And so um, they, a lot of the people they were working with on this group didn't have access to internet or didn't have access to devices or both. And in order to do this Zoom meeting to keep everyone safe, and they were working with lots of people who had, um, um, you know, situations where the, it wasn't ideal for them to come meet in person anymore during the pandemic. 
And so we've helped facilitate um, getting those devices to people. And again, that's an iPad kit that comes with an iPad and a Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, so we have those three main offerings for the public plus the partnerships. And we are working with AOA. We've, they've been on our list and we're trying to figure out a way to help get devices to seniors too, which is another population that um, may need a little bit more uh, training or help and support in figuring out how to use the device and how it all works. So we're in, in AOA is Agency on Aging. Agency on Aging, that's right. And KRH is the Kalispell Regional Hospital. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for clarifying that, Joe. Um, so we have when all those um, devices, those uh, latest round of hotspots coming out that Suzanne was talking about, although we did reply to an email yesterday saying we'd want more. Um, when those all get delivered, we'll have 85 hotspots all together, um, and that's 56 from the state library. Um, so 42 of them we have in kits and 43 are for individual checkout. Um, and so um, that has been Fantastic. As I said, I don't, you know, we're working with a large number of people who in the Flathead Valley who are not interested in wearing masks in our building and we're requiring masks to be worn in our building. And um, one of the accommodations we like to offer is a hotspot or a Surface Go device or an iPad kit. And it, they've been extremely popular. And so right now we're really looking forward to getting those next round of hotspots and um, devices up in the in the catalog and available to our customers because people have really been liking them. Um, and uh, the iPads, we have 17 in kits for the public. Uh, we have three without spot hotspots um, that are just the devices themselves. And before we got this last round of um, hotspots from the state, we were going to just put those iPads without hotspots because we wanted to keep uh, hotspots, as many hotspots available. But with this additional number, we were able to bundle those two into a kit. And I think that is a really nice option for people so that you don't have to put one hotspot on hold and an iPad on hold and hope that the timing overlaps and that you get them together. Um, you can get this whole package and be kind of ready to go and have that access that you need. Um, so that's exciting. Our Surface Go's are really popular. Um, and then um, we're looking forward to getting the three HP Pros from the uh, state as well. So that's kind of the lineup of how many we have and how they're distributed. Um, any questions about that, how we decided to divvy them up or anything like that? And I will say too that we have, um, this doesn't get into how many are in each location, but we have also divided them to each of our locations um, with the majority in Kalispell, but a fair number of uh, options available in Big Fork and Columbia Falls as well. And we're working hard to make them um, non-transferable between locations and um, so that the people in those communities have the access. And if they're willing to drive to another location, that's fine, but trying to keep them as much as possible in their home location there. So the question um, in the chat box was, um, so these are available for imagine if card holders only? Yes, that is how we've um, set it up. Um, and you know, that's something we've done with, before this, uh, the only real thing we had to compare, um, we, did, we do checkouts of projectors, like um, to, to do a presentation or to screen a movie in your backyard. And that was kind of how we had it set up with that you know, realizing that um, the hotspots themselves are not that expensive, but the devices are, you know, close to $500. Um, and so we wanted to keep that within our um, card holders um, use. And we did set up a, um, you know, at Imagine If we definitely believe in radical trust and are uh, trying, you know, we're fine free and we like to make things as, um, uh, show people as much as possible that we like trust them to bring things back and all that. But we did think really hard about the burden, the potential burden that if you were to not bring one of these devices back and be charged for it, um, you know, that is a significant um, bill to have on your account. And so that is 
something that we talked a lot about. And in the end, we did, you know, basically we don't want to charge anyone. We would just rather have the device back. Um, and that's basically our theory with all of our items. But for these particular ones, we did do have people sign an agreement before they can check out Tech Connect items. So it's a user agreement that they have to sign once every year, um, once we have it signed um, and they acknowledge that they see the fees that would um, happen if they weren't to bring something back. We keep it on file for the year and then we will renew it as, um, as needed. Um, so that is one, one step we did take with the devices. More questions. So are iPads or tablets in higher demand? Say that again, are iPads, what was that, I, iPads or the Surface Pros, which is, which, where's your higher demand? Well, so far it's been the Surface Goes because we have not fully started circulating iPads. <laughs> we should start that like any day now, but, um, I think that they will both circulate well. I think in general, probably people will take whatever they can get is kind of my feeling. But, I mean, that's been our experience so far is whatever we've had available, people just take it and use it, use it right up. So um, people are excited to have anything, but um, it will be interesting to see how, um, if there is a discrepancy in that. I'm imagining that they're with the number, you know, we have about 90,000 people in the county actually maybe closer to 100,000 now, find out soon with the census. Um, and having 14 devices or something like that, you know, it is kind of a, a drop in the hat. So I, I do think I expect them to all be out kind of all the time. Um, I did buy like charging stations for them. You know, I bought probably too much because I didn't, like it didn't really register that they would just be out all the time. And um, we do have people clean both you know, with like a wipe and then also physically or, or, um, reset the software and clean out so that there's not any, nobody can see previous users history on the browser, for example. Um, so we clean them both of those ways and then we charge them as they're waiting on hold for the next user to come get them. Mm -hmm. And is there anything preloaded on those devices? Yes, so we have, and you know, this is one place where I um, can see the challenges of being in a smaller library because we have leaned heavily on um, Sam Crompton, who is our um, IT person at right. um, Imagine If, and he has kind of gone on the back end and worked through. I'm going to forget the name of the system that he uses to manage them on the back end. So he was able, for the iPads in particular, he was able to um, set things up so that when we reset it, it will reload with the profile that he set up so that there are, you know, bookmarks for the Montana State Library or, you know, for, um, or for Montana Library to go and Libby is preloaded and Overdrive and, you know, a few of those resources and imagine if, um, homepage comes up when you open up uh, a website. Um, so he has done a lot of work, particularly with the iPads. Uh, with the Surface Goes, those just have deep freeze on them. And that's the same so software that we use on our um, other Windows-based computers that we have available for the public in the libraries. So those I feel like are probably, a that method is a little bit more um, friendly for someone who has less um, experience or time to set up the management of it. I think having someone who can be dedicated to the management of the iPads in particular, like once that was set up, I think now they're really easy to do, but I think the getting it set up is a challenge and took a lot of time, a lot of Sam's time to get that going. I suspect, I'm going to interject here for a second, yeah. I suspect what you're talking about is Apple Business Manager. Yes, um, it is. And you know, I think, you know, if you have as many iPads as you do, that it's probably worth setting that up. And you were looking into that on the state basis and thinking, well, you know, for those who are getting one, two or three, it's probably not worth going through that process and just kind of dealing with them individually. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to offer you some information to help with initial setup. But um, actually, since most everything's done in the cloud, with Apple, 
you know, you can always just kind of reset yeah. and, and redo things if they come back messed up and, you know, but we can go into that at length when people, we may end up doing extra webinars with individual setup things when we actually get those devices ready to go. So. Yeah. Thanks, Suzanne. That is. And, and then there is an additional software that I, I want to say it's like, yeah, Cisco or something. I can't remember. There's another software management that he uses as well, but I definitely registered with Apple Business Manager or management. Um, and, you know, so far the work has really paid off. I think um, getting everything set up and getting them out to people, they're in demand and almost always checked out. Um, you know, we had one particular user who told us how crucial it was for her. You know, she helped complete training to be a census worker um, by using the kit and like other, like really otherwise could not have done it because we were having a 30 minute time limit in the library and she had, you know, 15 hours or something of online training to do. And so it just wasn't uh, feasible for her to do that in the library. And so that was just, she was so grateful for that. And um, we've also had other people like, this is amazing and I'm so glad I can give it back to you and like not have this in my home all the time, which was something I was really uh, interested to hear because I think that in, in lots of places, people choose to not have Wi-Fi, you know, for some absolutely Wi-Fi, not having Wi-Fi at home is it's a financial burden and they just can't do it. For some, it's not available but some people choose not to have it in their homes. And so being able to access it when they need it and then give it back when they don't, I think was a, a real awesome service that we can offer. And then we have some regular users that have said, you know, it saves me gas money. I was coming into the library every day to download, you know, um, movies that I was gonna watch during the day. Um, by having this at home, I'm saving, you know, lots and lots of money and gas money and so he was so appreciative and he comes back you know brings it back every two weeks and puts it on hold again so he can get it the next time um and so that's again we're so excited to have more so that you can you know change that cycle and you can get them as often as he can and and everybody can um and let's see i think i have well, that might be about it. I just wanted to say thanks to the State Library um, for making this possible and possible and the um, IMLS uh, grant has been really amazing for us and that's all I've got. I've got my email address there but I'm happy to take more questions if people have any other questions about how we do things. I mean again I do realize we're a larger library and so we do have um, a little bit more um, staff to help work on this. I did, you know, was telling, Tracy was asking me how it went after um, we got our initial run going and um, it's like, oh, I think resources about policies, like how this should work, any kind of this and that. And she told me about the website and I was like, oh, <laughs> that would have been so helpful as I was setting this all up. So I think in some, you know, I think having Connie sign up for them and me take on the project that kind of got lost in translation. But I, I'm glad to hear that those resources are available. And I know, um, you know, the State Library are doing so much to help support people. Um, and, you know, I'm always happy to talk with people about any of the aspects of our program and how we did it or what I wish we hadn't done or, you know, any of that stuff. I'm always happy to have an email or a phone call and, and chat through. Um, our process and what we learned from it. There's a kind of an ongoing conversation in the chat box about Chromebooks um, as a device. And so I'd love to get all of your input on, on that. And Suzanne, you had a comment about that as well. So I'll let you start in with that conversation. Well, I don't know why we didn't go with Chromebooks because that was my assumption that that's the way we were going. And then next thing I knew we were seeing PC configurations. So I assumed that had to do with state procurement and you know, that um, <laughs> that's the way we go is, you know, with Windows and Microsoft products. So um, it's, it's a mystery to me. I will add if I can, I think we looked at Chromebooks as well. I mean, with all of the devices, there are challenges as far as personal accounts 
and logging in. Um, you know, with Apple, certainly that's the case, um, perhaps more so than with the Microsoft products. But that was one thing we ran into with the Google. For us also, it was the Chromebooks. I think it was the management, right, Deep Freaks. I, I'm pretty sure that Deep Freeze didn't work on Chromebooks when we looked into it. And so since that was going to be our go-to um, backend management or way to keep the devices um, safe and private for um, the users, we veered away from Chromebooks, at, at least I'd imagine if that was kind of what our conversation looked like. And then the other questions, a lot of come in uh, about whether or not you work directly with schools. Um, there's one question about whether or not these the hotspots from the state library grants are available to school libraries. I know a lot of um, parents are struggling with distance learning. So um, my under, Suzanne, I'll let you answer the question about whether or not a school library is eligible to get one of our hotspots. And then I'd love to hear from our Cal from our South Carolina folks about um, how you've worked with schools? Um, no, we're not giving out hotspots to school libraries, but uh, public libraries are welcome to work with their schools and um, you know share hotspots or put a hotspot in a school library for use or you know anything like that. Um, you basically we don't have enough to to put hotspots in all, you know, to do with schools, and that's an OPI matter, not ours. But what was the other question? Um, how, to what degree, and this is for our panel in South Carolina to start, and then Megan, I'll probably have you ring in at the end. Um, are you working, encouraging libraries to work directly with schools? How, how is that going? Um, we actually had, um, a number of school districts to reach out to our deputy director. So what we did was um, give that information to the directors and the project managers um, in those counties and they reached out to them and they're working together with the schools. So in South Carolina, are all your public libraries arranged by county? Yes. Okay, so there's a county like system. Yeah, yes. we don't have that in Montana. But, but that's, but you, we, we um, basically you said, we're not give, we're not directly um, supporting these devices in schools, but connecting a local school with their local library. Yes, because they would have to check them out through the library. Right. And Megan, are you, are you directly collaborating with the school districts in your area? We have not done that so far. I mean, I think kind of like Suzanne was alluding to the fact that we just, especially when we had 14 devices or something like that, we uh, were really trying to focus on the public. Um, as far as the tablets, I know that um, the school district five here in Kalispell has really made a good effort to try to get devices out to any student who it needed one during remote learning. Um, and so we haven't put our efforts in that. But I could see, you know, I like the idea of the, the um, bus ones, you know, where you can get multiple. And I think um, somebody asked in the chat, um, you know, I think these devices that we have from the state can do up to 10 uh, devices at a time. Uh, they do require a password, so you have to know the password, but if you know the password, it can be different individual user, users um, and up to 10 devices. So not as much as 100, but I think certainly um, can be helpful. Um, now that we do have more hotspots, it may be something, um, but I think primarily right now our focus on in our area is on just serving the public. Just to add a little bit about um, our partnership with the schools, we use them primarily to identify in need students. Um, and so that's where our encouragement comes from, not so much like making sure kids have access, but those who are most in need and those families who are most in need know where that material can be found. That's a good, that's good to know. There was a comment of wondering whether the Sprint T-Mobile merge will be affecting any of this stuff. Uh, 
I don't know. I mean, it would be nice if we, you know, got kind of sprint prices on things, but I can't imagine that it's going to work in our interest in any way. <laughs> or maybe I'm just being cynical. <laughs> Probably. Well, you've, you've been on the inside with the negotiations, and I just will draw attention to your comment, Suzanne, in the chat box about AT and T that they just didn't offer us in a price we could afford. Nope. And I will say, I mean, the price was one of the things that I thought was kind of the most concerning, you know, looking at long term playing, paying for the data plans. I mean, we are a bigger library, but our budget, I think we get $19 per capita or something, you know, so our budget is pretty tight and looking at the significant costs of the hotspot data plans was kind of overwhelming. And so we did a little bit of work to figure out where they could come from and then eventually we just said well you know for now let's just take these use them while the state library is paying for them <laughs> and like see if we can figure out a way to find them come elsewhere. To yeah and then you know like the worst case scenario is that when the funding ends from the state library is we discontinue those devices if we can't find funding elsewhere but we might as well use it while we have it it's kind of our thinking on that and then about a little bit about marketing for our panel. Um, at, what this librarian d just says that she's not having maybe a bit of a hard time and might be overstating a little, but they are not going like hotcakes in her community. So she's looking for suggestions on how to promote this in the, in the community, let people know. And I can speak a little to what we have done. You know, we did start just with word of mouth. We talked with a lot of our regulars who would come in every day and say, you know, we, we know you're in here every day. Like, are you interested in this? And I'll, some of them were and some of them weren't. Um, but then I think word spread a little. That word of mouth was really good for us. We did do signage. I don't think that, like in our library, we did signage. But I don't think that was a big, you know, we most of us know people don't read signs. <laughs> so um, I don't think that was a big seller for us. Um, and then we did press releases, we had done social media, and then I was lucky enough to have um, someone from one of the local TV stations saw one of our social media posts and asked if they could do an interview. Um, and then I think we've had a lot after doing a TV interview um, that I think really helps get people's attention. And so I think we that was great. So, I mean, if you do, I mean, you know your communities best and how to, to get word out about them, but I will, I think that piece I said earlier about not just calling them Wi-Fi hotspots, like speaking to what they do for people is really powerful um, because uh, people, some, you know, people can hear over and over Wi-Fi hotspots and they, like, if they don't know what that is, it doesn't mean anything to them. So talking about getting people the access or getting people internet so that they can do their work or get their kids homework or, you know, whatever that piece is, I think it can be helpful in the messaging when you are able to get that word out. There's a comment about um, uh, the tablets not being very popular in, in one library. Love to hear more about that, Cindy. And um, and Della in Shoto is saying that even um, though a lot of people in her community don't have internet at home, she hasn't really um, seen a great demand for them. And again, I think the other thing, Megan, was those, you know, those two partnerships you mentioned are also getting the word out. I mean, by maybe with partnering with the Office for the Aging and, um, the, and the local hospital uh, is one way that the word gets out you know, that word of mouth is always really useful in Montana. So maybe um, if you're not finding a lot of demand among your patrons, maybe um, maybe do reach out to a school or um, a community organization that might use them, a local coffee shop. Yeah, there you go. Find um, an organ, find a, a, a group in your community that, that might have a good use for these and get it started that way. Yeah, and I, I just want to say, to, oh, oh, sorry, Megan, go ahead. <laughs> and I just want to say, um, one of our directors, I was talking to him, and um, he's on uh, several boards in the community, and one of them was a, a homeschooling uh, 
organization. So, you know, even the homeschool co-ops in your, your um, communities, you know, just reaching out to those, uh, just organizations like that will help as well, get the word out. Yeah, and even I was gonna say, thanks, Jennifer, I think that's a good idea. We try very hard to reach out to our local homeschoolers um, and homeschool groups, um, but also other, you know, if you're a city or county library or, you know, reaching out to your other um, people in your department to, or your um, governmental agency structure, whatever it may be, you know, they may have forms that they're asking people to fill out online and people are, um, don't know where to do it. I, I mean, I know a lot of times people will say, oh, just go to the library and fill it out. But, you know, they, they can also say like, oh, you know, they have this over at the library and you could borrow it and take care of that or something like that. Sarah on Belgrade said they use the phrase, you can borrow the internet. So, yeah, kind of avoiding. I mean, we all well, know and what one a mobile thing, you know, we've always, is, but not everybody one thing one thing we've always done a lot of promotions with is like, you know, little bookmarks and brochures, and I haven't seen those yet. I mean, we've got some flyers. So if any of you have those, um, you know, because what great things to, to leave around, well, leave around sounds kind of strange, but um, to, to put in various places, you know, little brochures about this program or little bookmarks um, and at doctor's offices at um, places where, you know, unemployment, um, any place where, you know, people may need, you know, may want to get on the internet and, you know, ask if you can leave some things so that they know that this is available, um, you know, in school offices, um, you know, all kinds of places doing promotions like that. And, you know, I would love to have cute little bookmarks about, you know, check out the internet, you know, <laughs> you know, borrow the internet, whatever, you know, with, you know, with little Wi-Fi symbols on, you know, I mean, of course, I'm also waiting for your masks, too. I want, I want library masks, so promote away. Yeah, we can put these on masks and wear them around, borrow the internet. <laughs> A couple good comments in the chat box um, from Starl out at Hot Springs. I, I think many of the people in our community don't actually have a device at home. So the kid idea might work, she feels might work well in her community. And then uh, Jennifer says, I did that a long time ago, wanting, waiting to go into the waiting room of the doctor's office before the pandemic in my car repair shop that we had eBooks and audiobooks at their libraries. So maybe kind of putting um, uh, information out in unsuspected places where people are just kind of waiting for a little bit might, might be good place to put your poster. It's been a terrific discussion and we're getting about 10 minutes toward the top of the hour. So uh, let's see. Oh, Pam is also pointing out on the website there, there's logos that you can use um, to make bookmarks. Uh, and then Jody from Red Lodge, uh, can we talk logistics? What, when the hotspots are returned, do we need to charge the battery? Do we need to do anything to make sure they are functioning? And the answer to that is yes. So Suzanne, do you wanna, or uh, Megan, you've got a little more information about that. Sure, um, yeah, basically we have, um, we ask that all devices be returned at um, a desk, so not put in a drop, obviously, <laughs> you know, so you hand them to a person. And then we have different, um, bullet points that our staff follow for each device. Basically, the hotspots are super simple. We, we basically like wipe them down with the alcohol-based wipe to, you know, sanitize them. Then we turn them on to make sure that they turn on. And then we check the battery at that point to see if it's charged. And if it's not charged, we charge it. And if it is charged, we just turn it back off. And like I said, it's almost always when we check it in that we have a new hold slip to put on it. So we put the hold slip there and either charge it or not charge it and we keep them all in like one central area. Um, for the, for our iPads, we do, the process is a little bit longer. We wipe them down with an alcohol wipe and then we um, basically like reset the device. And so that takes a little bit longer and it takes, you know, five minutes or something like that which, you know, sometimes is not a big deal, but other times you have customers coming up in between and you're like trying to push the agree button and the next and all of that kind of stuff. I think that one is slightly more tedious, but it's still doable. And then the um, 
uh, surface goes are pretty easy because they have deep freeze on them. Um, so basically, we just ask the staff when, as soon as one is turned in, you wipe it down, you check it in, and then you restart it. And that's, you know, with deep freeze, that's all you have to do on those, um, those devices. So that's kind of, but I did, I have like a, you know, a document with all the lending procedures and, um, you know, what to go over with customers when they come and what do they need to understand and then what do staff need to do when they are returned. And I'm happy to share that stuff. I mean, it may be like way more bullet points than you want, <laughs> Jody, but um, I'm happy to share any of that if it's helpful to, to people so you can get an idea of what we do. And one recommendation I've heard from other states who are doing, you know, lending or have libraries who've been doing lendings for a while is um, to pick up some extra charging cords and devices because um, these things will be lost and you know you don't want to have uh, you know you don't want to have hot spots and or devices that you can't loan out because um, you know you don't have any way to charge them so uh, I think we put on the website um, some locations that you can go to pick up a few extras of these so you know it's a good idea to have some extra things around so that you're prepared for that eventuality because we all anyone who's ever traveled with a cell phone or anything like that knows that eventually you know you're going to leave behind your charger and uh, it just happens so and Megan's going to share those um, with me and I'll make sure they get out onto the website is that okay Susan? I just to say I, that's okay. I think I think we may actually already have them posted. Well, actually, okay. I don't know if they if they're posted to the website yet. But I know you, know, you guys have been really good about sharing your stuff. But um, I can't guarantee that it's up on the website yet because I put it someplace and I hope somebody will get it. <laughs> and I don't know. We'll, it we'll does, follow so. up on that. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we'll make sure it's available. Yeah. Joe, and then is, um, there's a question about the. Do, do the cables go out with the device? And, and everybody's nodding, yeah? Basically, yeah, yeah. charging cables go out. Yeah, they have to. I mean, sorry, but if you want them to be usable, they have to. <laughs> and they get lost, yeah. We all lose cords. <laughs> and uh, Beth, hey, Beth Bozeman suggests looking in your library lost and found for extra charging cords. <laughs> yeah, get those to work. But you have to be careful. Not all charging cords go with all devices, even if they fit. So, when, I lived, was, in when I lived in Seattle, that's where you looked for an umbrella if you needed one. It was in the lost and found. You just say, "I lost a black umbrella," and there you went. <laughs> Joe, this is Kylie from the Montana Shared Catalog team, and I just wanted to throw out there that um, for those libraries in the Montana Shared Catalog the devices they receive, whether those are the hotspots or eventually the iPads, um, they will come pre-cataloged. There's a little wiggle room in how you can, um, you know, adjust their home location and things like that. Some of the fields on the record, we want to stay the same for our data tracking purposes, but I'm gonna put a link to that article uh, in the chat for anyone that would find it useful. Again, for the most part, your devices are going to come pre-cataloged, but even if you don't get um, a hotspot from MSL, you purchase it separately, um, you can add it to the same record using the same instructions. And um, I'm going to answer, yes. I'm going to answer Jody online because I know this is a question that comes up. And that's all yeah. about, let me just, the, the question is about those extra cords and how, how those are. Well, the accessories, we're not able to, I mean, we don't have a budget to replace accessories. And so I think that's something that um, for the library, that's a good idea. And you can get most of those pretty cheap, except for the Apple stuff, which of course, there's always a premium on it, but um, it, that's just a good idea to keep it functional. As far as the hotspots and the devices, um, we're asking that you not charge replacements on those, that we will have extras that we can um, supply. I mean, as, 
hopefully this stuff doesn't get lost and damaged immediately and tons of them and that kind of stuff. As far as the lost um, hotspots go, you know, we ask that you wait for three days if they don't show up and then have it turned off. And then generally they come back once they're no longer functional. Um, they amazingly return. If it's damaged or sincerely lost, then we'll be keeping back a few extras and we can replace them for you. And it's the same thing with the, um, the iPads and the HP Pros because, you know, we really don't want the fear of, you know, monetary, of, of having to pay for these things to keep people from borrowing them and using them. You know, if we, if we come to the point where we're out and there's, you know, there are no additional funds for it, then we may have to redress it at that point. But for now, we want to get stuff out to the people who need it and the people who need it uh, may be frightened away at a $300 um, iPad replacement. So, you know, we ask that you don't do that. So, but it's, it's your library's policies. And I see all of our panel nodding on that. You know, the whole point is to try to serve an underserved audience. So the last thing you want to do is create a policy that um, unfairly impacts them because they have the least ability to pay. And yes, the iPads will come with cases. And um, Starla says they have a set price in their policy. Um, and Lori from Dylan said, we include instructions and troubleshooting that we laminated and put in with the hotspot and we put in the cord as well. So hopefully this has all been really helpful. I wanna take this last minute to thank our panel, um, our two women from South Carolina who gave up part of their day to share their experience. Really appreciate having you here. It's nice to have somebody with that much experience since we're kind of new with this project in Montana. And Megan, thank you very much for sharing. And we're getting a lot of applause in the chat box. And um, hopefully this has been helpful to everybody. If you're thinking about joining the program, um, hopefully this gives you some information. And if you're, if you're in, the, in the program in Montana, just getting started or kind of floundering around. Hopefully this gave you some good information as well. So if you need anything else from us at the State Library in terms of training, I hope you'll let us know. Um, this literally, this uh, literally came, this idea for this presentation came from a, a librarian in Montana who said, you know, I'd like to hear what people are actually doing with these things. And uh, we went, oh, that's a great idea. So um, best ideas come from you guys. So and we will stay on the line, but I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording. But thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, but let's just, uh, for those of you who are here, I will stay on the line a little bit longer in case there's anything else we need to discuss. So thanks.